It is an honor for me to join you today. I flew in from Nairobi, Kenya, and um, I'm here to talk to you a little bit about some of the stories that have, uh, some of the stories and journeys that I've been very fortunate to share with a group of really extraordinary individuals who span all the way from New Zealand to Tokyo, to Ghana, to Kenya, to other parts of the world. So I'll tell you three different stories. Uh, I'll start with the first one around Ushahidi. So if we think about pre-2010, um, if you remember some of the, the ways that information was presented to you, online obviously, you had sites like uh, D CNBC, Daily Coast, and I'm sure local Swedish versions that provided text, a picture. Now, that has evolved over time, obviously, with interesting ways where you get snippets of stories with uh, short bursts of video. Uh, we've got YouTube now, uh, Vice, uh, and different ways of consuming media. In my world, we had uh, TV. It was predomin predominantly the way that we found out information. So in 2008, um, I went back to Kenya, actually 2007 in December, and I was there for holiday. And the way that information was flowing at that time um, left much to be desired because the flow of information was not the way we, th the way we expected things to go. So imagine a contentious election. This is what happened in, in Kenya. It was a time of a lot of uncertainty. There was violence and frankly, an economy that was on the rise looked like it was teetering. And for us, connecting with the friends that we knew who, who were bloggers in the Kenyan community became difficult. And the, the simplest way that we could do that was via text. And sometimes when you had a, an edge connection, you were able to go on their blogs and figure out what is going on. So. We came up with this prototype, and I say we being the co-founders of Ushahidi, and it couldn't have happened without the support of the local Kenyan bloggers community. And we were able to create a prototype that provided a system to bring in information via SMS, via email, via web, and put it all together into one map so that you have an idea of what is going on where. Later, we were told it's called crowdsourcing. And um, we thought about that. And af about three, four months later, we quit from our jobs. I was a data analyst and a programmer in Chicago. And we put together this platform. At that time, uh, it was made with very basic software. It wasn't very sophisticated. But the idea was that other people who wanted to gather information about what was going on in their communities did not have to start from scratch. That we would think like a platform. That people would be able to use it, localize it, make it into, use it in whichever way they would like to use it. Be it for environmental issues, be it for elections, be it for disasters like Haiti or Japan or uh, whatever it is that the communities care about, that they can have a system for them to gather this information. And the bedrock of how we were able to do this was first and foremost collaboration. Without an open internet, first of all, we would not have connected. We worked with each other virtually for over a year and a half before we met in real life. So the bedrock of all these things is, I will say again, open internet and collaboration. And for us, it was powered by the need to enable others so that they do not have to start from scratch. So the word Ushahidi itself means testimony or witness in Swahili. This word has gu guided our prototyping in the early years. And then it also stands for the company that um, encompasses some of these uh, things that I'm going to, to talk about. It's been a catalyst for communities like the IHUB. It's been a catalyst for different things around the world, like crisis mappers, a network of people who use technologies like Ushahidi, not just Ushahidi, other technologies too, to gather information and to volunteer and to lend their voice to what is going on. So um, 
like I mentioned, this is just a glimpse of the, the team, including our board member, Dorcas Modani, who happens to be a really fantastic uh, entrepreneur who's using open source software in Kenya. And that's just to give you a visual of how much fun we have during our annual meetings. Um, but it's a really cool organization and we only get to meet once a year and this virtual way of working has helped us to learn a lot about each other and also how we can be self-motivated to connect, to collaborate and to work together. Since 2009, the uses of Ushahidi have proliferated around the world and like I mentioned, it's everything from election mapping um, to uh, to crisis mapping, to various sorts of mapping. Uh, and we're trying to do more and we're going to revamp the platform and a new version of Wushahidi will be available in September. So let's see one of those, let's pick out just one story and one use case so that we can see it up close. You were mentioning earlier uh, about getting prepared. Getting prepared for what? Oh, hurricane. So what, what would that, why would that be different than any other hurricane? The water comes from the Gulf, it pushes in, fills up the bayou, the bayou overflows, and it, then it fills up our houses if it's so. In turn, we would get, more than likely, we would get oil in our houses. What would that mean for the town then? I don't know. <laughs> we have no idea. I mean, I don't know. There would be no one left, so apparently we would, you know, we'd have no town. It doesn't flood as bad here, uh, depending on how high the water gets. It doesn't flood as bad here as it does at, in the lower end. So the problem in this state that we consistently experience is that the the uh, agencies, the government agencies and industry are absolutely not responsive. What we wanted to do with Ushahidi was to give people who live next to oil refineries and chemical plants a mechanism by which they could report their experiences and then have it show up for the whole world to see. We want to get a feel for what's going on, just how far the public health effects are being felt. There's not a whole lot of information out there. We're trying to get as much as we can. We also like to let people know about the organization and hopefully to try to get them to use our, our tools and the spill map to try to report exactly what's going on and to get a feel for what's not being reported by the rest of the media. Three trailers right next door on my property. Mm -hmm. That them people was getting oysters, you know, fishing oysters. Right. And none of them can get a job. A lot of the problems that some of the outreach teams have been having is talking to people that are now employed by BP and BP has a full gag on everything coming out. I mean these are fishermen that just got work and they're terrified of losing it. The only source of income that they have. So just being able to talk to people is I mean a success. You know my hopes are, are a, a few. One is to show the extent of the devastation I think anybody who was hearing Katrina appreciates the, the need for that. I mean, now, five years after Katrina, we have a lot of personal stories, and perhaps we also have personal archives. But there is not a map that shows the extent of the devastation. You know, there, there, is, there is something important and something, uh, some sort of justice in that documentation. This has been one of the most long-running uses of Ushahidi. They still require support. We do our part, but uh, I invite those of you who are, um, if you feel kinship with this team, would be happy to connect you. They're really wonderful and they've been doing a lot of good work over the years. And the network also, we've grown uh, as a community and as a company. So there are a couple of jobs posted. So if you like working for a virtual organization that is doing some good in the world using technology, please do join us and just that information is on our website. And like I said, a new version of the platform will be available in September. So one of the things that um, 
we learned later as uh, people started to see the work that we were doing. Um, a friend of ours, uh, Nathaniel Bullard, and a backer of Brick, uh, which I will talk about shortly, he said this, and I think that it bears sharing so that in your work, uh, as you think about some of the key things that help you to drive um, whatever it is, be it business, be it technology, is it, um, are you driven by function or uh, what are the influences that help to drive you? And how many of you like tea? How many of you like tea with different infusions, like different taste, be it sage, green tea, or mint and mixed all together? Fantastic, thank you. And um, I'll use the tea analogy to finish uh, the rest of the talk. And um, you can pick out some of the different infusions that help, uh, th that can you can bring together in your work. I will share a couple that have guided uh, some of us over um, the last couple of years. The first is the reality that we live in. So I moved back in Kenya in 2011, and it's an environment that um, our infrastructure is probably not as wonderful as Sweden's. Um, we've got frequent blackouts. Uh, these do are not fun. You know, you could be working and all of a sudden, no power. So that was one reality that hit us. And it was very um, debilitating for a team that is dependent on the internet. So imagine settling down to work and the connection goes out and you have to figure out now how am I going to get back online so that I can continue to be productive. And then you'll, you'll probably have to deal with it again over and over again. So we looked at the modem and we asked ourselves, what can we do to change this device that we need to be able to connect to the internet so that we can have less friction in the way that we stay online and stay productive? So we created the brick. And I'll just show you some of these uh, prototypes that we went through in creating this to, to show you that it is indeed a journey. Sometimes the prototypes don't look as pretty. Sometimes we just put them in a box to cover up all the ugly business on the inside. And sometimes we use Sugru, the stuff for fixing stuff, like the, that button over there, it was put together very quickly just so we could have a button. That thing worked. I was able to connect uh, and use it during a board meeting. And this is a prettier version. And this is one of the last prototypes. If you notice that button was in the middle, that will change shortly. And it teaches us that sometimes when things get difficult, we remind each other, and this is a motto that I'd love to share with you, there is that you can do hard things. It can be a bit difficult, it can be a bit ugly sometimes, but you can get back and prototype and do hard things. And we can also learn from the environment that it can help us to design for our, um, for our needs uh, as a response to something that uh, we're dealing with and to try and uh, innovate uh, or at least to, to change it in a way that works for us and hopefully it'll work for others in the developing world and emerging markets. The other story and the, the other infusion that I'd like to talk about is this around uh, the Internet of Things and use of sensors. It's 2014, we still don't have our jetpacks, but we do have sensors, really powerful things, be it light sensors, be it uh, motion sensors, accelerometers, and the cost of these things is rapidly dropping. Now, again with the brick, this backup generator for the internet, we not only env envisioned uh, the role of the brick to help us to stay online as individuals, but we also envision a way that the brick can help to connect people and to connect things, to connect sensors, and to be able to use that data and to have that data flow through the brick so that you can have it in, in um, a brick cloud, but also to, to make the world a bit more programmable, instrumentable, and hopefully we can understand and do interesting things um, with our environment. 
So this is um, in the back of the brick. OK, so this is the brick. And in the back of the brick, not only will you see a quote that, it, that says, if it works in Africa, it works anywhere. <laughs> it also says, designed in Nairobi, Kenya, manufactured in the USA. But underneath, right here, is the interesting um, general purpose input-output slot. Now, this is where we need you, the hackers, and the testers here in Sweden to figure out how you can connect sensors through this and hopefully join us in this journey. We don't know yet what you're going to make and what other people around the world are going to make, but the idea is that you would connect these sensors and try to make the world a bit more programmable and more interesting and nerdier. And you can come up with things like a weather station. So this story of the Internet of Things, if you read The Economist, Wired, and um, it, uh, and other publications, you will hear about the Nest and uh, different companies that are doing amazingly well. But I'm here to challenge you that the story of the Internet of Things is not just a Western story. It is also the story of emerging markets enabled through things like this and Arduino, Raspberry Pi, and all the other different ways that we're seeing the hardware evolution going really, really global. So you can connect things like weather stations. You can connect it to a tree and let your imagination run wild or of uh, the different potential uses of the brick. You could connect it to the stream and get you some, weather, some data about uh, the level of water or the intensity at, uh, with which the water is running through the stream. There are very many, many uses. And one more infusion that I'd like to talk about that is done by our team, our data analytics team, and how can aggregating data help you to get a bigger picture of what is going on? Remember how we started with gathering information from the bottom up with Ushahidi? Now, Ushahidi is continuing with that process. And one of the things that we thought about when we, jo we, we were able to uh, bring in expertise in data scientists is that data science is also about storytelling, that it's about finding true stories in data and telling those stories and giving you a bigger picture. And as we thought about this, we realized there's a lot of data around the world. Some call it big data. Some of it is messy data in different formats. It's very fragmented. And finding these different formats of data has been really quite a difficult challenge. So if you take one, one problem, for example, the problem of Ebola in uh, Liberia uh, and West Africa, if you were to find all the different data sources, you would find them in so many different formats, it would be very difficult for you to get an aggregated, clear picture of what is going on. And also, it can be very, very complicated to take that data it may need more than 61, 681 lines of code to just to be able to bring all of that information into one big picture before you can make anything that is useful. We are doing something about that. So we've came, we came up with crisis.net, and it's a way that pulls in information, again, like, very much like Ushahidi, but this time around from social networks, networks like Facebook, Twitter, and even Ushahidi sites. Um, bringing together that information in one dashboard so that you can create a fire hose of data. So you can have a ticker tape of sorts um, of the world's crisis data. Why would we want to do this? We would want to do this so that for a first responder, you can create an app in a matter of minutes. If you know Python, you can bring in some code. And we've already seen some of these things being used by different newsrooms. Um, and we post how to do this, how to use this uh, technology and how to use this to be able to create an application that a first responder can use, that you can use in gathering and dealing with the massive amounts of data that are there. So uh, we not only need data partners, but most importantly, we, we just need you to help to prototype and to take it. It's all open source. It's available on our site. Uh, and see what you can make of it. And uh, join the community uh, of Ushahidi that is trying to, to use all these tools and to, to, to work together. And last but not least is we build what is needed. 
And CrisisNet is not just a platform that can aggregate and normalize crisis events data, but then it's part of the future of crisis data. This is a sneak preview of the Ushahidi platform version 3 coming out. It's kind of pretty. Uh, I'm biased, but I think it's really great. I hope you'll be able to try it out. And I do hope that you can help us to translate it into Swedish because um, the Ushahidi platform is currently available in 42 languages and it's really important to us that it's available in yours too. So please join us and help us translate the platform into your language so that when something comes up or if you have an interesting project that you need to crowdsource information, you have it in Swedish. This is an overview of the crisis happening in Liberia, and this was done using crisis.net, and it also uses crowdsourced data from an Ushahidi-powered site that is done by um, the iLab in Liberia. They're a great group of people who've been working with little to no funding over the last two years to bring in data about what is going on in, in the parts of Liberia. Really fantastic work that we're, we're supporting them and we hope we can get more support for them in the next few years. Why? Why do we do this? We believe that you are Q, you are double a seven. We are Q. Our passion is technology and we hope we can give you the tools that you need to do whatever drives you, whatever drives your community, to, to make sense of data in your community. The last infusion that I'd like to share with you is one of adventure. And this is where how the environment can help you. It can help you to uh, iterate and to change things. You remember when I showed you the on button for the brick that it was in the middle in the one of the prototypes? Now, I'll show you the process with which we were able to iterate and change the design of the brick so that you now the indicator light is decoupled from the power light. So the power is on the side. These are just indicator lights showing the outer ring for Wi-Fi or connectivity and the inner ring for uh, power. So green basically shows that the power is quite okay and blue is that it's connecting on the Wi-Fi network. And the power button is over here. Now the testing that helped us to change, um, I will show you a little bit about that. And in the spiritual, in the spirit of sharing about adventure, this is a picture of the brick car during the Rhino Charge. Um, and I'm just showing this so that you can come to Kenya and join us during our next expedition. And uh, one of my favorite authors, William Feather, mentioned that one way uh, to get the most out of life is to look upon it as an adventure. And if you go to openexplorer.com, you'll be able to see not only the story of the brick, in Turkana when we were testing this, but then you would also be able to create your own story that the software is powered by CrowdMap, which is also another product of Ushahidi, is sort of a separate issue, which I'm proud of, but I urge you, um, I'm really inspired by some of the stories that I see on Open Explorer, and it's inspiring me and hopefully uh, you to go on an excursion, go on an adventure, and in that process, what can you learn to help to iterate better your uh, products or even your business, or at least, at the very least, to have fun with people that you work with. So this is a quick video showing one of those adventures. Video. All right, uh, it's not working? Okay, I'll just wrap up and then I'll, I'll show you the video at the end. It, um, it's okay, we can just, uh, we can go back and uh, show the video at the end. Okay, so just a thought really quickly around um, network effects because one of the things that we've been learning over the years when you create platforms that people take and make global and um, use. And when you start things like the iHub, is one of, one of the things that you think about is platforms and the ecosystems that you can create out of that. Um, 
one of my favorites, uh, he's now a chief scientist at salesforce.com. His name is JP Rangaswamy. He says that platforms enable ecosystems. They are multi-sided like exchanges and marketplaces fo focused on simplifying interactions between participants. And he also mentions that uh, the smartest person in the room is no longer just a person. It is now the room. I'd like us to think about that for a moment because as technologists or as business people, you either have a product or you're building on top of a product or building on top of a platform and you're, cr you're, uh, you're a part and parcel of an ecosystem. Many of you may, uh, the conversation about Google, that's an ecosystem. Now, what I'd like to leave as you think about the different infusions of uh, the different influences that help you in your work is what ecosystem are you participating in? Is it an ecosystem of the open internet? Is it an ecosystem that helps to foster openness and transparency and good in the world? What sort of ecosystem are you creating? What sort of platforms are you creating? What sort of applications are you building on top of? And last but not least, how are you opening up the door for others? For us in Kenya, through the work of the iHub, which is a, a community of um, software app makers, uh, venture capitalists, and it's a space actually to just connect and to, to figure out what is going on. Now, what we're working on with a consortium of other, um, other businesses in Kenya is to create a maker space called Gearbox. Um, Gearbox will provide the space and the equipment that would make the beautiful laser etched things that you see here and make that technology available for innovators and inventors in Kenya. With the early support of Lemelson Foundation, we hope to do more. Again, to open up the door for others so that they do not have to start from scratch. And as we are prototyping the brick, we're not done yet, we're doing more, and um, we'd like to prototype more things, but we don't want to have to have those weird conversations with customs border agents who are wondering why you're carrying so many bomb looking parts in your luggage because you're carrying antennas and circuit boards and all these things that you need to prototype. We should have those things in a space and provide that opportunity for others. So that's what our team is working on. And this is the space that we're working on right now. And as we think about the ecosystems that we work in, the sharing that we give, because it is in sharing that we create value. For those of you who's, who use Uber or Lyft or other car sharing services, I don't have to tell you about the consumption economy and the sharing economy and what good there is in that. The thing is, we need to share more and to be able to do things in a different way of creating these ecosystems. Last but not least, the flow between these ecosystems. They're really interesting partnerships. This is a picture from the recent uh, Directors Fellows Offsite uh, with MIT Media Lab. So there's now collaboration between the iHub out in Nairobi with Cambridge in the US. And Joey Ito talked about turning the MIT Media Lab into more of a platform. We understood this better when they all came to our country, despite their travel advisories. Obviously, we had to protect, we had to have security, and we were really glad that we were able to do that. Um, but the invitation here is for you to connect with interesting global centers that can help you to be innovative and to figure out different ways of doing things together and to share and to learn together. And I'll leave you with this quote and I'll just leave it for a second for you to read it. But I'm reminded when I read this that uh, one of the internet's gardeners, Peter Sunde of Pirate Bay and my favorite uh, startup, Flatter, uh, which is a social micro donation platform, he is in jail, he shouldn't be. To just spare him a thought,
So my hope is as you reflect on the different infusions that you're going to add to your uh, repertoire, that you add the open internet as one of those infusions. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you. Can we see, do you think we can get the film to work? Um, let's see. Should we try it one more time? I'm very curious. Let's see. Okay. I don't know. Let me try. Otherwise, obviously, we'll put okay. it online just after. Yeah. Let's do that. I have, I, I first thank you so much for this uh, perfect response to. No, yes, <laughs> perfect response to, to my rambling uh, introduction. Completely coincidentally, I have to say, uh, one of the other things we were talking about outside with the matrix uh, is uh, when could we find tools uh, for alliances of individuals and wider groups of citizens against, against locally powerful corporations. Well, just now, as you've demonstrated, uh, Ushahi did us that. Uh, I realized uh, I maybe should have said, because I'm not sure uh, how much everybody is following what's happening in Africa, for instance, that, that the mainstream African story today is a middle class story. Mm -hmm. But one big difference, of course, is that this is a middle class with middle class careers who do have this sort of level of crisis aware awareness and uh, and in the in the shifts that we're living in right now uh, where these crises are coming everywhere to other to other continents as well and that's going to be the reality for the remainder of our lifetime certainly do you see a sort of mental shift where there is more interest in these particular combinations of skill sets um you're absolutely right that the, the narrative of Africa has changed. Uh, I'm really glad it has changed, by the way. Um, I think one of the things that is happening is we're a bit more connected to the rest of the world, which is fantastic. So some of these global conversations about crises are actually now just global, uh, are more global than, oh, crisis only happens in Africa. You know, that story is shifting. Um, and I guess the, the thing is that we're now in this together more so than any other time in history. Uh, and we can learn from each other, not only in terms of the types of innovations that are uh, in the quote-unquote West mm -hmm. versus the innovations that are coming from the uh, global South. But uh, one of the things is that the barrier to finding out what is the solution for you is much lower now. Mm -hmm. And in, in terms of the connections, uh, in terms of uh, figuring out who are the organizations that you should work with, my first stop is the open internet. Uh, organizations like Mozilla, uh, the Crisis Commons, um, so many others, I'm blanking out right yeah. now, mm -hmm. but so many others who care about the open internet, those are the people that you, you, you just connect with them and find the time to, 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 to figure out what is going on. And they'll more often than not show you some of the tools because many of them are also global communities. Mm -hmm. So the discoverability of the tools that would work for you is, uh, the, the cost is, the discoverability, it's more possible now to find out what's going on. Yeah, I, I wonder if you could untease a little bit for people like me who don't have tech backgrounds. Uh, you said uh, driven by function or driven by technology. Could you just give some example of what that means? Oh, um, <laughs> going to Silicon Valley, if you look at the startups that are getting millions of dollars, just have a look at what are they driven by. Mm -hmm. uh, some of them, it's like looking, f it's you make an app to look for a problem not you have a problem and then you make the app to deal with the problem. Like the one about parking, you've heard about that one for parking? There's, no. a, there's a startup, let me not get in trouble for... <laughs> <laughs> Hypothetically, there could be a startup. <laughs> Hypothetically, there could be a startup to revolutionize and more, make more efficient parking uh, in the US. Um, 
So that's one example that is sort of driven by uh, we want to make an app, so we're going to look for a problem mm. or perceived problem. Excellent. Uh, can could, uh, we have time for audience questions? Uh, I should have warned you first because uh, in the Scandinavian countries uh, we get shy and paralyzed at these moments and forget that we actually know English and have known English since we were children. Uh, we do that in Kenya too. Oh, yeah. thankfully, yes. So. Um, Anyone? Yes, you do. All right, down here. Uh, yeah. yeah, hello. Uh, I, I, I didn't quite get if, are you a, like a company driven by some kind of profit or are you an, like an organization all volunteer or? All these different initiatives are, how do you organize yourself? Anyway, yeah. Great question. So Ushahidi itself is a not-for-profit. Uh, its mission is to change how information flows in the world and to catalyze innovative ventures. Uh, so the BRIC is one of those ventures that has uh, been catalyzed and with the approval of the board is now a for-profit company. Uh, a standalone uh, for-profit company. And uh, for the iHub, it continues to also act as a not-for-profit with the mission of connecting um, innovators to capital and also creating a space for them to basically do what they need to do. Hi, thank you so much for your talk. I think it's really amazing, um, and thanks to the conference to give you the stage to share all these uh, amazing stories of digital innovation coming from Africa and going across the world here today. And I was really interested to hear your updates on CrisisNet and the way that iLab in Liberia is using it currently. Is this kind of the first um, real life use case you're having of CrisisNet, or is it being used in other situations and instances already as well? Just in case uh, this was a little fast, just in case somebody in the back didn't process. So the question is, uh, is Liberia the first uh, use case basically of crisis net or is there a history of more of them? Um, so this is probably the first one in Africa. We did do some data analytics using crisis net around Iraq with the barrel bombs uh, and Syria. Um, so a lot of that, that information is in our blog. But this is, uh, I would say, the highest visibility one. Uh, with iLab Liberia, they've been putting in a lot of hard work over the last couple of years uh, to maintain um, the, the website. It's lern.ushahidi.com. And they pull in all the in this information. In that particular case, they're still using the Ushahidi platform. And then what we did is we pulled that data plus some of the WHO data to create the visualization that, that is shown, that I showed. So the update is that crisis.net is, uh, it's off alpha, it's now in beta. So for the techies and the developers in the house, uh, please just go to our blog and there'll be ways that you can, you can pitch in uh, or you can use it for whichever else uh, which, whichever topic you care about. I should add here that we're in a very special situation in Sweden where for about a decade nobody was sort of legally, no part of government was legally responsible for the civil defense. The, somebody is now, so don't worry, but there's a, there's, a big <laughs> there's a big lack of organization and I think the forest fire news, that if you've been following this story in Sweden recently, demonstrates that there are problems with large-scale crisis also in, in very sort of tri trivial, relatively trivial weather-related uh, situations in Sweden, so there could be use cases even here to develop and, and try these things further. We have time for another question. Over there. Yes, right hand side, top back. Good. Don't apologize. You want to try the video? There we are. Thank Thanks. you very much for your talk, Juliana. It was great to, to hear the story of you, Shahidi. And I was most struck by the comment that you made at the end. I've been researching the collaborative consumption or sharing economy movement over the last four years. And I do think that there is a real problem with the kind of nice to have solutions rather than the problems that actually need to be solved. And it is a really powerful movement, but perhaps not being addressed in the right way. 
how do you think that we could actually incentivize all of these smart minds to actually focus on the problems first rather than the solutions? That's a very, very good question. Um, I think one of the incentives, I'll just talk about the incentives for me as an individual and perhaps that could be one of the possible answers. I don't have the answer specifically to that, but I'll just share what drives me. Mm -hmm. um, if it matters to those in the room who need that extra incentive, is that really when you look at the news, the world is a mess. It's really, really a mess. From I don't even have to tell you how messy it is, you all know. It's really, really sad. But one of the things is that when you're involved in open source or um, in technology um, that, that has a social component, is that it gives you hope. When you log in and somebody has a question about how to use the, um, this particular piece of software for the elections in Mozambique or for something coming up in I don't even know where, the few moments that you have to be able to answer that question, it gives you that hope that you're helping somebody out. So perhaps the incentive for others is just that um, we have this empathy to stand in somebody else's shoes and to be able to assist, to lend a hand. That will in turn incentivize you and will push you to, to, to contribute to do more to help others. And that's not just for nurses and doctors of medicine, Sun Frontiers, it's for each of us. We can find ways to give back. We can find ways to help somebody because I think that is where we can find hope. And with time, it can help us to even find more meaning or to add meaning to our lives. I would like to add to this very good answer that of course there's it also makes business sense yeah because it does. because when things are not working uh, and it's not just when people are dying but any kind of inefficiency in governance for instance obviously it, it, it creates a lot of costs somewhere along the value chain and and quite often that, that cost is not only paid by the weakest uh, individuals in the system, it's also paid by governments, for instance, or, or it represents a lack of profit somewhere that could benefit an economy. So if your systems analysis skills are high enough that you can also figure out where the costs are going, it's in somebody's in financial interest to solve this problem. So it might actually be a job, mm -hmm. even if it's, it might be a job for an NGO, for instance. Uh, it might not necessarily be a business, but it could also be a business. Uh, and that could create, I think, uh, these things together, the most meaningful work life uh, imaginable. Yeah. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Juliana Rotich.